bad chord, I think. Make sure this is... This is on. My dad used to sing this song all the time at Christmas. You know, it's a wonder. When I say a wonder, it's something amazing. <clears throat> that God would plan salvation, that God would... I said in Sunday school, this was God's idea. That God would come up with an idea for people that many of them, most of the world, would not want anything to do with Him. Most of the world would never accept Him as their Savior. Most of the world hates God. And God still devised a plan to send His only begotten Son to come and save those that wanted Him. And then all of the benefits of salvation. It's an amazing thing. And, of course, everybody thinks about it more at Christmas time. Uh, but we ought to be amazed at God. And I have said this often before. When was the last time you were amazed at the Lord? And so I want you to think about it. This is a Christmas song, but the wonder of wonders. But just think about uh, the setting that night. Think about all that God has done and how incredible it is that He would choose. He chose to do this. He chose us before we ever chose Him. It's an, it's an amazing thought. And so think about it this morning. Let's give Him the worship and the praise that He's due. The wonder of wonders As she looked on His face that this little boy spoke the worlds in their place. The stars and the moon shining brightly on them. The earth and the sun were created by him. The wonder of wonders oh how could it be that God became flesh and was given for me the almighty came down and walked among men oh the wonder of wonders he died for my sins. The wonder of wonders, as she heard his small cry, that this voice had thundered on Mount Sinai. His small hand she held, so tenderly had made a dry path through the mighty Red Sea. The wonder of wonders as she looked down and smiled that he was her maker as well as her child. He created the womb that had given him birth. He was God incarnate, come down to the earth. The wonder of a wonder Oh, how could it be that God became flesh and was given for me? The Almighty came down and walked among men. Oh, the wonder of wonders he died for my sin. Oh, the wonder of wonders. He died for my sin. I'm... 
I am thankful that he died for me. Take your Bible if you would, stand, and turn to the book of Colossians. If you don't have a Bible, there are some uh, black ones there in the chairs you are welcome to use. Please get one. Turn to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, and we will begin reading in verse number 12. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 12. The Apostle Paul is writing here to the church of Colossae. And, uh, of course, the preacher just started a few weeks ago a series on the book of Colossians. He's still in chapter 1, and so I'm not trying to steal any of his thunder. Um, Why is Siri up there? Stupid phones. We don't say stupid dumb phones. I apologize for saying the S word. Philippians chapter, Colossians chapter 3. All right, let's pray. I'm just going to. Heavenly Father, I pray you'd help us this morning. And uh, God, we're not here to entertain. We're not here to impress. We're not here to wow. We're here to preach the word. And so God, I pray that you would help me. I'm nervous this morning. And so I pray that you would calm me a little bit. And um, God, Empty me of myself. Lord, fill me with your spirit. And God, help me to preach exactly the way, exactly what you want me to preach, what you've given me. And Lord, I pray that it would be a blessing to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 12. Remain standing. We haven't read yet. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. I want to preach on this this morning, how to have a peaceful life. How to have a peaceful life. The angels said to the shepherds when they proclaimed the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, peace and goodwill. They brought a message of peace. And of course, that peace comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think we would all agree this morning, the world is looking for peace. And I don't mean world peace, nation among nation. Of course, everybody's calling for that, and we'll never see that until the Lord Jesus Christ returns and sets up the earthly kingdom. But the world, and I'm talking about individuals today, they're looking for peace. Everything that we look for in life, everything people do in life uh, is to fill a void that they have in their, uh, in their heart, in their spirit. And they're looking for peace. They may look like they've got it all together, but at night when they pillow their head, it's, I'm looking for peace. If they could boil it down to you, that's what they're looking for. And as Christians, we battle the same thing. I mean, we have problems. Just because we're saved doesn't mean our life is easy. Just because we're saved doesn't mean we no longer have troubles and trials and tribulations and storms. We just have Jesus now. Amen. And he goes through them with us. Amen. He doesn't send us through them. He goes with us. Remember when Jesus told the disciples, get in the boat, let us go to the other side? The promise is in what he said. First of all, let us means I'm going with you. Go to the other side. He'd already determined, doesn't matter what happens on the sea, we are going to the other side. We're going to get there. And it's because he was with them. And then he went down to the bottom of the boat and slept. And so just as he was with the disciples in that storm, he's with us in our storms. He doesn't send us through them and meet us on the other side. He goes with us. But a lot of Christians today, they don't have that peace. Now, when you get saved, you get peace with God. That means this, before salvation, I was the enemy of God. Sin has separated me from God. I cannot have that relationship because of sin. And Jesus is that mediator. He's the peacemaker, if you will. He's the one, because of his blood, if I accept that, then I have peace with God. God's anger and wrath is appeased toward me because of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's peace with God. 
But today we're talking about peace of God. We get the peace of God in our situations in life. But I want to boil it down, the message this morning, uh, to your everyday life. You know, I've been looking at, at our home and in our life, and sometimes, Miss Candy and I, we've prayed about this here recently. I'll pray again in a minute and let you sit down. But we, we, we look, and sometimes, I think I said it last week, sometimes I'm more patient with you and, and the teenagers and your kids than I am with my own children. And I find sometimes there's not, you know, there's not peace. We've been praying a lot, my wife and I, we've been praying a lot for our home that there would be peace at home. You know, we come in here, we put a smile on our face, and we don't, I don't know what's going on in your home, and you don't know what's going on in my home, but the truth of it is, there's probably not a lot of peace in some of our homes. Uh, you know, kind of the running joke at Christmas time is, oh boy, the family's coming, the in-laws are coming over, and you know, there's not going to be any peace with my, my mother-in-law in the house, and my mother-in-law's not coming this Christmas, so, and she's at church this morning not watching. I'm just kidding. She knows I'm joking. Um, actually, I think she might uh, show up here later on to see the baby, but not for Christmas. But anyway, you know how it goes. We, we talk about our family and our in-laws. Ah, I don't want them to come over. I don't get along with my family. No peace. No peace. Jesus said, or Paul said it through the inspiration of the Scripture right here, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Rule. We're going to talk about peace today, how to have a peaceful life. Let's pray again, and then we'll get into it. My Father, I pray that you would help us this morning. God, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to say anything that you don't want me to say. And so I pray that you would guard my mind, direct my, my speech, my words, and God, may you do the preaching this morning. I pray that you would speak through me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Peace. Peace is something everybody wants. Obviously, if we were to look back at the, the rest of chapter 3, there are some people problems or some relationship problems going on here in the church at Colossae. Look at verse number 1 there in chapter 3. Paul says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. So he said, listen, salvation, if ye then be raised, you're no longer dead in your trespasses and sins like he told the Ephesian church in chapter 2. He said, if you're raised, then seek those things which are above. Quit looking down here at this stuff. Don't be, be, don't be so concerned uh, horizontally. Be more concerned vertically is what he's saying. He goes on to talk about a few things. Now uh, look down at verse number, uh, verse number 7. In the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them, but now ye also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to Why would Paul say lie not one to another? Because they're obviously somebody's lying to them. They're lying to each other. Oh, uh, this anger, wrath, all this stuff's going on there. Uh, he says lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Uh, where there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. So you read down through there, and obviously there's some relationship problems going on in that church. Whether it's family related or just folks in the church, some people just aren't getting along. There's anger, there's wrath, there's malice, there's lying, all this stuff. Paul said, listen, if you're saved, you should have put that off and put on the new man. You should be different now that, you're saved, now that you're saved. You see, Jesus Christ is the common denominator in this room this morning. Mike and I probably have a lot of different opinions about a lot of different things. Brother Tony and I probably have a lot of different opinions about a lot of different things. But you know what unites us this morning that's greater than all of our opinions about all that other stuff? The Lord Jesus Christ. He's the equalizer, if I can say it that way. That's the one thing that we all have in common. And because of that... I can have peace in my life, but I can have peace in my relationships with others. Now you think about your relationships this morning, whether it be relationships at home with the family or extended family, relationships on the job. Do you have peace in your life? Honestly. Don't, don't raise your hand. Don't say yes, I do or no, I don't. Uh, you answer to yourself. Do you have peace in your life, because just like the world is looking for peace, they're looking for the peace of God, God says we can have a peaceful life. Just because I live in a crazy world doesn't mean my life has to be crazy. 
Just because there's wickedness and ungodliness and, and craziness all around me doesn't mean it has to be a part of my life. But yet I see so many Christians, their lives are wrapped up in that, that nonsense. It's a drama all the time. We don't need that. We need peace. We need peace. Peace means to join. It means quietness. How many of you like it when it's quiet? Yeah, absolutely. I like it when it's quiet. The teenagers, the guys usually come over on Tuesday nights for soul winning, and uh, sometimes it gets loud. You know, David likes to stand. Apparently he can't sit. How wide is my house? Like 12 feet? But David can't see the TV 12 feet away. He's got to stand like right here, you know, and nobody else can see the TV. <laughs> Just kidding you, David. I love you. But, you know, we get excited, and it gets loud over there, and it's okay. But sometimes, you know, if i got a headache, sometimes all that noise, I'm like, okay, they, they, go to the porch. You know, I'm just like, okay, I can't handle it. I'm going to kill somebody, you know. when we've all been there, the noise. Sometimes we just need quiet, right? Some of you probably wish I'd preach quiet. Who, who laughed? Okay, I'm going to preach quiet today. Bless God! Yeah, right. Quietness, it means rest. Rest. How many of you have gone to sleep at night but got no rest? Your mind works all night. Uh, you see, you're, you're not in control of your mind when you're sleeping. And you have dreams and you have thoughts. And my wife, her recurring dream is she goes back to college. She went the other day. And, uh, you know, she goes back to college, and we're married, we've got our kids, but she goes back to college, and everybody's there, all of her roommates, and I told her, I said, they're probably hating you. <laughs> Look, we all graduated. <laughs> Stop bringing us back. <laughs> you know, but, but you go to sleep, and you wake up the next morning, and you feel exhausted. You ever been there? You know, your mind is working overtime. You're studying for midterms or finals, and you, you pass out, and you with your face in the book, and you wake up, and you feel like, man, I got no sleep. I got no rest. Why? Because your mind is busy. We need rest. We need that. That's what peace is talking about. And really, in the context of the Scripture, as we read down through that, he's talking about peace in our relationships. We need that, that quietness to be joined together. It means to set at one again. There might be some, uh, uh, a marriage in here today that you're, you're, you're separated. Not, I don't mean physically, but in your mind, you're like, hey, you know what, she ticked me off this morning, I can't stand her. Come on, anybody ever been there? Sure. I love her, but I don't like her right now. Right? We all understand that. There might be some relationships in here that need to be set at one again. You need to get some rest. There might be some relationships between teenagers and parents. There might be some, rela there might be some folks in the church on this side of the auditorium. They, you're mad at somebody over here on this side of the auditorium. Hey, it happens. It's part of, it's part of life. People are people. But God still says, let the peace of God rule. So how can we have that peace? Before I tell you, I want you to understand what that word means. Verse number 15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Rule. The word rule means this. It means to govern, to prevail, or to rule, as a king would rule. But then it said this. It means an umpire. An umpire, as in like baseball. An umpire, a referee in basketball. How many times have you ever, if you've played sports, have you ever argued with a referee and gotten a call overturned? I can't remember any as a player or a coach, and I've argued with a lot of refs. Uh, I got hit in the face yesterday in a basketball game by a pastor. Now, he didn't intend to, but I'm standing right here in front of the referee. And this guy reaches over my back and goes, smack, and smacks the ball out. And I'm like, he hit me in the face. And the ref goes, I'm like, what? Now, I didn't lose my mind. I didn't lose my temper. I just thought, I can't believe that. I'm four feet away from you. He must be like David. He needs to be right here to see it. <laughs> David, you're going to be the one I pick on today. I love you. All right? Hey. 
an umpire. It doesn't matter what this verse is saying. To rule in your hearts means he's got the final say. Let the peace of God have the final say. That means it trumps your emotions. It trumps your feelings. It trumps your thinking. Somebody says something smart to you and you want to respond back with, well, uh uh-uh. The peace of God trumps that. That's what that means. Let the peace of God rule, umpire, govern your heart. Why does it say rule in your hearts? Because the heart is the seat of your emotions. We've talked about this in Sunday school uh, with the teenagers. I think I've even said it in here before when I've preached in the past. Our, we, we think based on our feelings. And then we make decisions based on those thoughts. So really, the decisions you make, the words you say, the things you do, it all comes out of your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the Bible says, the mouth speaketh. And so the way you feel about something determines the way you think about something, which then determines how you act about whatever that situation or person might be. And so he says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. You know, the Bible says that we're dead men. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Dead men don't feel. Right? He hurt my feelings. Well, if you're dead to the flesh and alive to God, then you can't feel that. Not supposed to. Dead men don't feel. Dead men don't think. Dead men don't talk. Dead men don't do. You see, if I'm dead to myself, if I respond in a wrong manner to whatever situation or person in my life, it's because I've brought that dead man back up. I've brought the old man back up. And Paul said right here, put that off. Put that off. Put on the new. Now, so he's saying let the peace of God rule or govern or prevail in your hearts. Not over others, hearts i'm just laying some foundation but in your heart let the peace of god rule in your heart you know i've prayed for folks before who i felt like they were you know they were wrong they did me god would you fix them god the way they did this the way they said that what they're doing right now uh, lord they're just wrong they're struggling i'm not trying to be pious or proud or arrogant but god they're just wrong but you know what god always says to me Why don't you just worry about you? Because I'm not perfect in any relationship. It may be true that you did wrong. But you know what the old saying is? Hurt people hurt people. If I'm hurting and you come up and poke me in that spot, what's my my natural reaction going to be? Well, I'm going to hurt you back. Hurt people hurt people. So when somebody's lashing out in in a relationship, one of the two parties needs to understand, hey, they're hurt. Let the peace of God trump in my heart or umpire in my prevail in my heart, and I'll just take whatever they're giving out. And it'll be okay. Because they're hurting. They're hurting. So let's talk about the peace of God. A peaceful life. How do we have a peaceful life? We're going to go backwards. Our key verse was there 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called in one body. God says to live peaceably with all men. That's what he's talking about there. You're called to a life of peace. That means you have to be the instigator. If, If you have an unpeaceful relationship in your life as a Christian, God expects you to instigate peace. You say, well, they started it. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if you started it. You are to be the instigator of peace. You're called to a life of peace. And let the peace of God rule. So how do we do that? How do we do that? Go back to verse number 12. He says, put on therefore. Put on means to what? Get dressed. Get dressed. Just like putting on the whole armor of God. Paul says here, God says it through Paul. Put on these things. Now, uh, before we get into those things, uh, put on, therefore, as the elect of God. You know what it means, elect of God? That means you are chosen. You're chosen. God picked you to do something for him. God picked you to serve him. So he says, as the elect, as handpicked, As chosen by God, I need to put on these things. Then he says this, as the elect of God, 
Holy, still describing who we are. Holy, that means pure. And beloved, that means favorite. So elect, holy, and beloved, that's who you are. And so God, what he's saying is, live that way. Since you're chosen by God, and you're supposed to be pure and holy, and beloved basically means God treats you like you're his favorite, then live like that. Not too many Christians run around living like the devil's their father. Then they gripe, they complain, they whine. I quit saying they, I'll say me. I gripe about the weather. I did it this morning. There's snow in the Midwest, and it's probably not going to get here. I told her last night, I've been watching the weather for three days. Okay, I mean, if you don't know me, I love snow. This is, hands down, my favorite time of the year. And from Thanksgiving to, like, 4th of July, I want it to be snow. I mean, absolutely. I want to be buried in it. I mean, make, make me a snow coffin and bury me in an igloo when I die. All right? I like the snow. And so for three days, I've been watching the storms out west move to the Midwest, and I'm checking the 10-day forecast for Philadelphia. And you know, They're like, there's a rain-snow mix next Thursday. Mm-hmm, better change to, like, all-snow blizzard whiteout. <laughs> I looked last night. You know what it said, 10-day? You know what it says for next Thursday? 50 and rain. Amen. <laughs> you need to get your heart right with God. You need to get your heart right with God. <laughs> I told, I, I don't know who it was, I told one of the boys, this is funny, honestly, then, okay, humans are silly, okay, it's the little things that bug us, can I be honest with you, it really offends me when we don't get any snow, it really does, I get a snow globe, don't give me a snow, <laughs> give me a lot of snow globes, because I'm going to break them and dump them all over the house, <laughs> You say, really? You get offended about no snow? It's Christmas. There's supposed to be snow on the ground. That's the way it's supposed to be. We are north of the equator. (laughs) Okay, there's my little rant. So we complain. Get back on track. We complain about the, the dumbest little things. I mean, it's little things that set us off. But Paul says, hey, you're chosen, you're holy, and you're God's favorite. Why don't you live like that? Stop living like God doesn't care about you. Stop living like God doesn't take care of your needs. Stop living like God mistreats you because there's no snow. You're God's favorite. Miss Lisa sings that song, He loves me like I was his only child. That's, that's amazing about God that he loves every single one of us that way. God has that. There are a few people that I've met in life that have that ability, but when they're talking to you, they just make you feel like you're the most important person on the planet. That's God all the time. All the time. So let's live that way. So that's who he's talking to. He's talking to the elect. He's talking to the holy. He's talking to the beloved. If you're not there, get there. Amen? So he says, put on these things. Now, let's look at them, and we'll move quickly. Put on these things. How to have a peaceful life. Number one, put on the bowels of mercy, he says there in verse number 12. Bowels of mercy. We talked about bowels last week uh, being the seat of the emotion. In Bible times, we would say today, I love you with all my heart. In the Bible times, if they used that phrase, they would say it as, I love you with all of my bowels. That was the seat of the emotions for them. And so what he's saying is here, have the, it's inward affection. Bowels of mercy. It means to be inwardly affected, tenderly affected to have mercy or show mercy on other people. Now, my mom's not watching live stream, and so if any of you tell her I told these stories, um, I will call you a liar because she'll be here in a couple of weeks. But my mom was not a merciful person. My dad showed mercy. My dad had the bowels of mercy. My mom had the bowels. Well, never mind. My mom didn't have much mercy, and I love my mother to death, okay? But my mom was the one that, one mistake, and I'm, we're just dropping the boom. Dropping the hammer. It's, your life is over. You make one mistake, and you're dead. You know, my dad's like, hey, hey you know, we don't have to kill him this time, you know? We can, they could, we can let him live a little bit. They're only three, <laughs> you know? My mom was like, she, she was all business, 
And there are times in our lives when we need all business. In your relationships, think about it, how to have a peaceful life, and he's talking about our relationships with others. All right, There are times, I understand, when somebody, you need to just rip their face off. But that's very few and far between. They said of the they 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 say uh, they taught me this in Bible college that for a pastor he's the shepherd of the sheep. You feed them daily, you shear the sheep yearly. You only slaughter them once in a lifetime. But there's too many people. All right, let's bring it down to us. There's too many people running around slaughtering everybody. You say something, man. Dinner was terrible tonight. Right? Not literally shooting anybody. Okay. <laughs> Get the, you get the point? We're just running around slaughtering everybody because they ticked me off. Or because I'm having a bad day. They really didn't even do anything, but I woke up on the wrong side of the bed, and you're all idiots. How many of you have ever gone to work like that? Everybody is a moron today. Yeah. Maybe it's you. <laughs> right? Maybe it's not everybody. Maybe it's just you. So he says, put on the bowels of mercy. It means inward affection. Tender mercy it means to move, to be moved or stirred with compassion toward another person. We said this in Sunday school. I don't know what everybody's going through. Yeah, I mean, you're, you, you dress up nice and you got smiles on your faces this morning, but you could be going through the biggest storm of your life and I have no clue. And because you might be going through something and you might be hurting, I say something trying to get a laugh out of you and it hurts your feelings and you lash back out at me, I need to step back and go, wait a minute. Obviously, hurt people hurt people, so I must have hurt them because they're trying to hurt me back. That's what it's saying. Compassion, tender mercy. Hey, we ought to love each other in here. And so instead of going after each other, well, you know, she shops for the, she shops at the same store I shop at, or she wore the same dress I wore, or he said this, or she did that, or they did this, or they looked at me that way, or they didn't shake my hand, or whatever it might be, because people are crazy, and they get upset about the goofiest little things, right? Right? Okay, thanks. Just making sure you're on the same page. It's hard to be, listen, it's hard to be upset at somebody that you're moved with compassion toward. I'm just talking about having some empathy, having some sympathy. Hey, everybody's having a hard time. What was that statement Dr. Howes used to make? Love everybody because everybody's having a hard time, something like that. I don't know what you're going through. You don't know what I'm going through. So let's just have some tender compassion toward it. The bowels of mercy. It's the same word as Romans chapter 12, verse number 1. You could probably quote it, but turn your Bible over there and let's look at it. Romans chapter 12, verse number 1. I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's the same word. Mercies is the same word as bowels of mercies there in Colossians chapter 3. The mer- think about the mercy of God. Mercy is, is what, class? Not getting what you deserve, right? So as sinners, what do we deserve? Hell. As saved, what are we not going to get? Hell. Right. That's mercy. Not get God's not going to give me what I deserve. We talked about, I think it was last week in my message, uh, that the Bible says he punished us less than our iniquities deserve. So I, I commit a lot of sins. I make a lot of mistakes, but God punishes me less. That's mercy. So when someone wrongs you or hurts you, show them mercy. Well, I didn't deserve that. God didn't deserve to be crucified. Jesus didn't deserve to have his beard ripped out, crown of thorns pushed down on his head, beaten like he was beaten. He didn't deserve that, but he did that so you don't have to. If he can show that kind of mercy, then when someone says something snide to me, I can go, you know what, that's no big deal. Great peace have they which love thy law, and how many things shall offend them? Hey, if you you spend a lot of your time getting offended... Book. Do I need to go on? If you're offended all the time, you need this. 
So he says, put on the bowels of mercy. Then he says next, put on, go back to Colossians chapter 3, he says, put on kindness. Listen, as the beloved of God, as chosen, handpicked by God, show some bowels of mercy. Show some kindness. Number two, put on kindness. You know what kindness means? Gentleness. Goodness. Really, these things are all very closely related to one another. And I think God's just trying to make the point, hey, if I could say it in our vernacular today, be nice to people. You want to have peace in your life? Be nice. What's the golden rule, class? Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Maybe they don't know the golden rule. So why don't you show them? Kindness, it means gentleness, goodness. Uh, take your Bible, go back to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Talk about how to have peace in your life. Romans chapter 2, verse number 4. I'll show you what the Bible says. Uh, it's kindness. Romans chapter 2, verse number 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness. Same word as kindness in Colossians. And forbearance and long suffering, Not knowing that the... Goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Repentance. Has God been good to you? Has God been gentle with you? Think about the times you have, I mean, I mean, royally blown it. Maybe, maybe made a mistake nobody in here knows about, but uh, you think, man, I cannot believe God didn't kill me for that one. Right? We've all made those kind of mistakes. I'm talking after salvation. And how did God respond to you? Well, they obviously didn't kill you, right? Your life is still pretty good. You woke up the next morning and His mercies were new. And goodness and mercy follow you all the days of your life. That's kindness. You say, well, I'm not God. No, no, but let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I, may not, I won't be perfect until I get to heaven, but every day I ought to be trying to live like the Lord Jesus Christ. Gentleness kindness he says put it on put it on that means you have to make a decision every day i'm going to be i choose to be kind we have probably all got people in our life could be family could be co-workers but we've all got people in our life that we know at the beginning of the day they're probably going to act like a jerk at some point right i had people that i worked worked with in the past and and went to school with i thought man i don't even want to go today because i don't have to deal with them Right? Okay? Everybody understand what I'm saying? So before you get to that point, why don't you make a decision before you leave the house? I'm going to be kind. Even if they're a loser, even if they're a jerk, even if they treat me bad, I choose to be kind. That's what it means to put it on. You have to decide to put it on. Because if you don't make a conscious choice to have bowels of mercy and kindness, you're going to go to work, and the first thing they say to you at 8.05, why'd you wear that to work today? David told me last night, he looked at my boots, he goes, what are those? If I had those boots, I'd step on them myself. <laughs> That's exactly what he said to me. If I had that face, I'd step on my own face. Huh. <laughs> right? So you know somebody's going to say something dumb, and we all know us. I know how short-tempered I am. It was fine, Miss Daisy. We were giving each other a hard time. Don't, don't kill him. <laughs> She's back there going... <laughs> the, you should see the steam's coming out of her ears, David. It's bad. Don't turn around. We know us. I know how, how quick my temper can go off. And if I don't choose to put these things on ahead of time, then they will control me the whole rest of the day. 8.05, somebody says something dumb, and my whole day shot. I'm out of the spirit. <laughs> Uh, all I, I may be sitting at the computer taking care of my work and getting the job done, stocking shelves, but the whole time I'm thinking, I'm going to slash their tires. <laughs> They're going to have a terrible Christmas, right? <laughs> you say, oh, I've never thought of stuff like that. Yeah, oh, yes, you have. You're human. <laughs> and we're all the same. <laughs> kindness. Gentleness. L listen, kindness is the opposite of harsh. I'm, I'm pretty sarcastic at times. <laughs> I, can be, I can be pretty sharp with my tongue. And sometimes I might feel like, you know what, they deserve a tongue lashing. 
But kindness is the opposite of that. Kindness is this. If you have to bite it off, bite it off. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. Not literally. Hey, kindness is the opposite of being harsh and hard. It's the opposite of being difficult. You know what else kindness means? It means excellence. Excellence. Do you give to people excellence? Think about your relation. You say, what do you mean by that? Do you respond to them in an excellent way? Do you treat them in an excellent way? What did Paul say? I'm writing to the elect, holy, and beloved. Beloved means the favorite. If God treats you like the favorite, do you treat anybody in your life like they're the favorite? Or do we treat us like we're the favorite? Do I treat her with excellence? Oh, that may be nice. I may be kind. I may be very loving. Do I treat my kids with excellence? Not all the time. Oh, I mean, their needs are met. They've got food. They've got clothes. But when they ask a question at an inopportune time, do I respond with excellence? What? What are you? Leave me alone. I'm preaching and meddling and Sorry. Put these things on. Bowels of mercy, kindness. Number three, humbleness of mind. Man, it's getting hard, isn't it? <laughs> this one's no fun. None of these are fun. Put on bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind. Humbleness of mind means this lowliness of mind. First Peter chapter five. Let's look at a verse. First Peter chapter five. Verse number five. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. You know what that means? That means I'm your servant. I am, I am beneath you. How many of us think like that? Enough said there. All of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Humility. Philippians chapter 2, we quote the verse, verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Well, you know what that mind's talking about? You read Philippians chapter 2, and it says, God, or Jesus, who thought of not robbery to be equal with God, yet he made himself of no reputation and became lower than the angels, and he became one of us. Now think about that. Here's the God of heaven, God the Father, Jesus Christ spoke the world into existence in the book of Genesis, did all of the miraculous miracles that he did several times in the Old Testament, showed up, came upon Samson with mighty power. I mean, think of all that Jesus is. He's, he sits on the throne of heaven. Earth is his footstool. And yet he demoted himself and became flesh. With all of its sinfulness and depravity and ungodliness and this world that God created so beautifully and we have royally messed it up. God became that. And he lived perfect and sinless for us. That is humility. And Philippians 2.5 says, let that mind be in you. I'm not better than anybody. Now, that's one thing to say, but do we live it? Do we live it? Oh, I know I'm not better than anybody, but do we become the servant of anybody? Or do we expect everybody to, well, I've got a title, I've got a position. I, don't you know who I am? Humbleness of mind. When you act with kindness toward others, it takes the focus off of you and it exalts them. See, number two leads to number three. When you start treating others with kindness, it becomes about other people. So is your life about others or is it about you? Let's move on. Humbleness of mind. Number four, go back to Colossians chapter three. Put on therefore, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness. You know what meekness means? Gentleness. 
Again, God's just, he's stating it over and over and over again. We are very quick to fly off the handle. It's, it's human nature. I mean, one thing wrong and we're just, we're gone. We lose it. We lose our cool. We lose our temper. Some of you might, some of us might think, oh, I've got better control of my temper than others. But really, what is it that makes you go from zero to I'm going to run you off the road what, what, what gets you there that, the quickest? What is it? Because if you're losing it that quick, there's no kindness, there's no meekness. There's no meekness. You know how many times God said to Moses in the Old Testament, get out off the mountain, your people have blown it, I'm going to kill them all. And they deserved it. And Moses, the meekest man in the Bible, would go to God on their behalf and say, God, that... That's not you. God, you're a lover. You're not, you're not a hater. You're not a destroyer. God, you're... Even back then, Moses knew who God was. His personality was love and blessing and kindness. And that God's still just, and God's judgment, and God takes care of all that stuff. But God's prevailing character outside of holy is his love. That's who he is. It's not what he does. It's who he is. Am I like that meekness? It means softness of temper. How quickly do you lose your temper? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Go back. Just one book back. Two books back. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse number 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. It's a great thought. Are you walking worthy? I'm not preaching that, but it's a good thought. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, soft gentleness. He's just reiterating it. Man, be, be kind, be gentle with people. Go back to Colossians 3. Let's hurry. He says meekness, then he says long-suffering. Put on these things, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Long-suffering means this. It's a big word. I looked it up yesterday because I didn't know what it meant. Here you go, Jada. Longanimity. At first I thought that can't be a word. Longanimity. It's a word. Here's what it means. Patient endurance of hardship, injuries, or offense. Long suffering. You hurt me once, I might be able to deal with it. You hurt me twice and I'm walking with God, okay. You hurt me three times, eh. We're done. That's not long suffering. Long suffering is you might be having a terrible life and you just continually hurt me and 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 hurt me. And I just respond with, I love you, I love you, I love you. I love you. I love you. I let you see, it's kind of like what Jesus did with us. How many times a day do you hurt the Lord? I mean, your sin is offensive to God. My sin is offensive to God. He sent his son to die for me, and yet I lose my temper because somebody cuts me off in traffic. Or I lose my temper because they left pickles on my hamburger at McDonald's. Or I lose my temper because of whatever. You say, that's crazy. How many of you have ever lost your temper over something dumb like that? Right, it's the straw that broke the camel's back. And that is offensive to a holy God who says, when you do that to me, I love you. But when somebody does that to me, who do you think you are? You low down, no good piece of garbage? Get out of my life. God never one time has told me to get out of his life. And truthfully, he probably should have a long time ago. Long suffering. Hurt people, hurt people. Do you patiently endure the hurt and the disrespect? Or do you lash back out? Then he says in verse number 13, we're almost done. Verse number 13, forbearing one another. These are things to put on, forbearing one another. That means to put up with. Literally, it means to put up with. It means to hold oneself up against. Dominic, come here. Dominic's the whipping boy this week. I'm not going to whoop you, though. All right, it means to hold up against. All right, 
lean in on me. To hold up against. I'm going to push a little bit harder. Okay? I'm, I'm hurting him. Not physically. I'm, I mean, you're, you're such an idiot. Why would you, why do you dress that way? Why, what do you, what do you do? You know what some people do? Comments like that, they just fall off. Okay? Come back up here. But he's decided, I'm going to be kind, I'm going to be gentle, I'm going to forbear. There's somebody in my life that I know is going to attack me at some point today, but it's just who they are. It's their personality. So I'm going to brace, and I'm just going to take it. I'm going to hold myself up. I'm not going to fall into the hole that they have fallen into. I'm going to brace myself up against that, and if I can... Reach down and try to help them out of that hole that they have fallen against or fallen in. You see what I'm saying? Thanks. That's what forbearance means. To put up with or to hold up against. It means to endure the trials and tribulations often brought on by others or by trying to help others. Maybe there's somebody in your life you've tried to help, and when you reach out to help for them, they, they bite the hand that feeds them. Right? You know what forbearance is? You just keep trying. You just, just keep trying. You see, human nature says, okay, burn me once, shame on you. Burn me twice, shame on me. It's not happening a third time. But God says, I love you. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow thee all the days of thy life. His mercies are new every morning. You know what that is? I'm just, I'm just keeping going. God just keeps going. He just keeps giving. Whether I respond right or not, he just keep. He daily loads me with benefits. That's forbearance. And then he says this, forgiving one another. These things really, they all build up. Forgiving one another. That word means to grant pardon as a favor. As a favor. You know what a favor is? That's something you don't really deserve. I'm going to give you this. You're not paying for it. You know, you haven't earned it, but I'm going to give it to you. It's a favor. Christmas time's coming up. You know what all those Christmas presents are under the tree? Favors. She didn't deserve all those Christmas presents. She sure doesn't deserve all those Christmas presents. I was at her house last night, saw all those wrapped empty boxes under your tree. <laughs> You're going to be heartbroken on Christmas morning, opening up nothing. <laughs> but they look nice. <laughs> those are favors. You didn't earn them. My kids don't deserve every single Christmas present they ever get, every birthday present they ever get, everything I have. They don't deserve them. What are they? I give them to them because I love them. Forgiveness, it means the same thing. It means to give as a favor, pardon and rescue and grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. But grace is getting what you don't deserve. Not only did God save me from hell, that's what I deserve, God gave me heaven. I don't deserve it. Not only did God forgive me of my sins, past, present, and future, but he's punished me less than my sins deserve, and he daily loads me with benefits. I don't deserve that. You understand? Forgiveness is not for the other person. Forgiveness is for you. If you are bitter in your heart, if you are angry at someone in your spirit, and you just cannot get over it, you know how to get over it? Forgive that person. You say, they don't deserve it. Neither did you. But he forgave you. You see, forgiveness is not about them. Forgiveness is about you. Because they don't know you're bitter. They could care less if you're bitter. They don't have any idea that you hate them in your heart. They don't have any idea that you're angry and have malice and wrath and envy and jealousy. They, don't, they have no clue. And so at night, they sleep wonderful, and you lay in bed at night worried and ticked off and, and trying to get revenge, and you're having conversations in your mind with that person. Why don't you just forgive them? You want a peaceful life? Forgive. Forgive. I forgive you. And it may not work to just say it in your mind. You may need to go to that person. I forgive you. It's taking them off your hook, putting them on God's hook and saying, God, you can handle it. And if you choose to do nothing about it, I'll be okay with that. 
Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Then look at the last one there in verse number 14. And above all these things, put on what we talked about last Sunday. Charity. Do all those things, and then on top of that, put on love. You see, it is possible to forgive without loving. It is possible. It is possible to have the right spirit and forbear against somebody without loving them. It is possible to be kind without love. It is possible. It is possible to extend mercy to someone who does not deserve it without loving them. But God says, do all of these things and then cover that, love them too. So, do you have a peaceful life? He says in verse 15, let the peace of God rule. Well, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. You know, not one of those things says to retaliate. Not one of those things leads me to believe that I ought to pray for God to fix you. Every one of them is about me. So if you're looking for peace, stop looking around and start looking in the mirror. It's not my brother or my sister, oh, it's not my brother or my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. My Father, I pray that you'd help us now in this time of invitation. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. A lot in that today, peaceful life. Maybe you got peace with God the day you got saved. Maybe you've had the peace of God in your life, but... Maybe you don't have peace right now in some of your relationships. Maybe your homes are kind of in turmoil, a lot of fighting, a lot of arguing, a lot of griping going on. Maybe there's an extended family member that has hurt you in the past and you just haven't found it in your heart to forgive them. Maybe there's school problems. Maybe there's teacher problems. Maybe there's job problems. Listen, life is made up of relationships. And if you don't have peace in one of those relationships, it can affect the rest of your life and your relationships. And so peace this morning comes from God, and it comes from you following that recipe right there. The bowels of mercy, kindness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. Maybe you're here this morning, and you're not sure that you're even saved. You know about God. You, you may even know some Bible. But if we put it like this, and you were to die today, do you know for sure that you would go to heaven? As sure as you're sitting here this morning, are you that positive that if you died this afternoon, you'd go to heaven? If that's not you, if you don't know that for sure, would you slip your hand up? I just want to pray for you. You say, preacher, I don't know that I would go to heaven if I died, but I'd like to know, would you pray for me? Slip your hand up. 